तो आ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरी वन आई डॉक्टर पूनम जोशी वेलकम यू ऑल टू अवर हेडमेक एक्ट्रेक एकेडमिक क्लासेस आर टूडे स्पीकर इज डॉक्टर रिचा वैश who is professor in department of head neck surgical oncology tata memorial hospital mumbai dr richa will be speaking on the role of sentinel lymph node biopsy uh, for management of oral cancers uh, so i welcome dr richa dr richa please go ahead with your presentation so uh, i'm just uh, sharing my screen and uh, is my screen visible yes it is okay uh but it is it is in slide mode so you can make yeah thank you okay so uh, good morning everyone and uh, today we are going to discuss about the sentinel node biopsy in oral cancer 
So uh, the management of neck and early oral cancer has been a matter of a debate for more than five decades now. And initially to begin with, the, de the debate was whether should it be wait and watch and do the neck dissection as in when the node de develops, that's a therapeutic neck dissection or elective neck dissection to address the neck at the time of primary surgery and even if there is no, no manifest node, that is elective neck dissection. And this controversy is basically for the lesions that can be excised perorally, like early tongues or anteriorly located early buccal mucosas. So with the publication uh, from our institute, uh, uh, now we know the answer that elective neck dissection should be performed in all node negative patients. And we know from this trial that there is an absolute survival benefit of about 12.5% and there is uh, a benefit of the disease uh, free survival. So that is how it is and therefore the elective neck dissection should be offered to all. So doing one elective neck dissection improves the overall survival by 12.5% and it reduces the risk of death by 36%. And similarly, uh, if we do the elective neck dissection, it improves the disease-free survival by 23.6% and reduces the risk of recurrence by 55%. So one death is prevented for every eight neck dissections performed and one recurrence is prevented for every four neck dissections performed. We also know the similar data from the SEND trial which supports the role of elective neck dissection and this has led to the incorporation of elective neck dissection in the guidelines. But what is also clear from these uh, trials is that about 55 to 70% of the patients are actually true or negative and they do not require a neck dissection. And the second thing which is very evident from these trials is that the neck dissection is associated with morbidity, which can be somewhere in the tune of about 50% when it, a 40% when it comes to the nerve damage, and it can be crippling in about 5% of the patient in terms of the nerve damage. In addition, there are other morbidities, a difficulty of swallowing, speaking, there can be chyle injury, hematoma, etc. But uh, most of the times when we talk about the neck dissection morbidity, it is a shoulder dysfunction. And uh, we all know that the spinal accessory nerve traverses through the neck. And therefore, when we clear level 2B and level 5, there is associated paresis. There can be palsy if the nerve is uh, cut inadvertently or if it is involved with the disease. So there is a morbidity. So to circumvent the morbidity of the neck dissection, there is the concept that has been evolving for more than a decade now. And this concept is a concept of, a concept of sentinel node. So what is a sentinel node? Sentinel node is a lymph node which has a direct drainage pathway from the primary tumor. That means that lymph flows from the primary tumor. It travels first to the sentinel node and then it goes to the other regional lymph nodes. Now, this means that if the sentinel node is the first echelon or the first uh, basin, then it has to develop the metastasis before any other neck node. And if the sentinel node is negative, that means that the neck in all probability is negative for metastasis. Now, this is a concept which has been explored in 1960s and it, the first time the term sentinel node was used by Gould. And in 1977, for the first time, uh, it was uh, the lymphatic mapping was done in penile cancer by Cabana. In 1992, Morton et al. described the use of intradermal isosulfan biblio dye injection for the sentinel uh, lymph node localization in melanoma patients. And in 1993, we have the concept uh, of uh, peritumoral intradermal injection of radioactive tracer followed by preoperative imaging and intraoperative gamma probe localization of sentinel node in melanoma. And this was uh, described by Alex and Craig. And this is the most common protocol that we used uh, in our oral cavity cancer patient, that is a radio tracer injection. Now, we all know the pattern of lymph node metastasis. We know from the old landmark papers by Lindbergh and Shah that there is a echelon which is more commonly affected by the regional metastasis when it comes to the sites of the oral cancer. If we slightly extrapolate this concept a bit more, so it's the same thing. We are identifying the first basin that is going to develop the node. And as we can see, there is a definite pattern. And that is why the sentinel node uh, biopsy is quite acceptable in oral cancers. Various methods of sentinel lymph node biopsy have uh, been described in literature. Conventional lymphocentigraphy with SPECT, MR lymphocentigraphy, MR lymphography, CT lymphography, PET lymphocentigraphy, and many more. But most commonly performed is a conventional lymphocentigraphy with a PET scan. And uh, this is usually done with a technetium labeled uh, radio tracer. 
a nanocolloid, which is a human serum albumin, and this emits the gamma ray, and these gamma rays are detected by the probe and the camera, and that is how we uh, perform. This is the gold standard in oral cancers today. So what are the steps involved in the sentinel lymph node biopsy? The first step is a, a preoperative peritumoral injection of technetium-99 labeled nanocolloid uh, albumin. Then there is a dynamic lymphocytography using the planar imaging. When there is an emergence of the sentinel node, there is a spec, a spec CT imaging that is performed, which helps helps in uh, understanding the anatomical location of the tumor. And then the sentinel node biopsy is performed under the intraoperative dissection of the uh, sentinel node, which is guided by the portable gamma ray detection probe. And then it is subjected to the um, extensive frozen and histopathological processing to identify the metastatic focus. This is a very, uh, this is a concept which is now more than a decade old. And these are the initial reports. This was a publication in 2010 in JCO by Seventos, and in which he performed the sentinel lymph node biopsy and reported the good diagnostic outcomes, where he reported that the negative predictive value was 94%. And if we do the additional sectioning and immunohistochemistry, the negative predictive value improved to 96, 96%. So with such a high negative predictive value, it is definitely a very safe procedure and the neck can be spared if the sentinel lymph node biopsy is negative. We always knew that it has a very good diagnostic accuracy, but whether it can have a therapeutic role was first reported by Centrile that was published in 2015 by the uh, Mark McGuack and Claire Schilling group. And in this, uh, in 14 European centers, uh, 415 patients were recruited, T1, T2, N0. These uh, patients were thoroughly investigated using various imaging modalities uh, to ensure that these were clinically known negative. And in this trial, they could find the sentinel node in 99.5% of the patient. It was positive in 23% of the patient. A false negative result was 14%. And when they looked at the outcomes in terms of disease-specific survival, the three-year disease-specific survival was 94%. In terms of the diagnostic accuracy, the sensitivity <clears throat> was 86% and the negative predictive value was 95%. And there were only minor complications associated with the procedure, which was seen in about 3% of the patient. So this was for the first time we understood that sentinel node biopsy has a very good uh, therapeutic role as well. After that, there was a publication back-to-back -back of two landmark trials, one from the French group and another from the Japanese group. This is the trial schema of uh, both the trials. So these studies uh, recruited T1, T2, N0 oral tongue, and these patients were randomized either to the sentinel node biopsy arm or the elective neck dissection arm. And in this, the sentinel node biopsy was subjected to frozen section. If the node was metastatic on the frozen section, a completion neck dissection was performed in the same sitting. And if the node was negative on the uh, frozen section, in that case, a serial step sectioning and the immunohistochemistry was performed. And if it was reported as negative, no further neck dissection was done. However, if it was reported as positive, there was a need of a second sitting for the neck dissection. Now, this is a publication from JCO 2020. This was a French trial uh, conducted by Gerald et al. It was an equivalence randomized trial to compare the treatment on the basis of the sentinel lymph node biopsy versus elective neck dissection in operable T1, T2 oral and oropharyngeal cancer, sentimoral trial. This was a multicentric trial. And the primary outcome was to assess the oncologic equivalence of sentinel node biopsy and neck dissection for oral cavity cancer by comparing the two years neck node reference-free survival. So what we now know from the trial is that the two and five year neck node recurrence free survival rates were very, very similar in the two arms. Um, and the difference between the two arms in the two year neck node recurrence free survival was 1.1%, which was lower than the 10% hypothesis. This is evident from the Kaplan-Meier curve and we can see that both the curves are absolutely intertwined. There was no significant difference was observed between the arms regarding the neck node recurrence free survival. Now, in this trial, it is important to note that in the sentinel node arm, there were 11 patients who had isolated uh, tumor cells and they did not uh, complete the neck dissection. These were treated as negative and none of the tumor, none of the patient had a recurrence in the neck in these patients. Yeah. Only one patient had a local tumor recurrence and another one had a second primary. So this was a concept which is coming out from the French trial that probably there could be a role of observing the neck in isolated tumor cell if it is positive on the extensive histopathological processing. In terms of two and five years local regional recurrence free survival, again, we see that the difference was not significant in the two arms and the p-value was only 0 0.83. And again, we see completely intertwined uh, curves. 
similar outcomes in terms of two and five year disease specific survival, two and five year overall survival rates. Everywhere, it's absolutely no uh, significant difference in intertwined curves. Now, this was the oncologic outcome of the trial. If you look at the functional outcome of the trial, in terms of the uh, hospital stay, we see that there was a significant difference of the median hospital stay in the neck dissection arm and sentinel node arm. If we see in the num terms of number, it is the, num the difference is only of one day. But if you look at the range carefully, you see that the upper limit for the neck dissection arm is 94 days and for the sentinel node arm is 30 days. So this difference was significant. In terms of mainstay, again, uh, it was 10.4 for the neck dissection and 8.09 days for the sentinel node arm, and this difference was also significant. When the author studied the physiotherapy prescription rates at 2, 4, 6, 12, and 24 months, of all these months, the initial six months, there was a significant higher rate of physiotherapy prescription in the neck dissection arm compared to the sentinel node arm. However, at the end of 12 months and 24 months, we see that the, so the, there was no significant difference with the similar prescription rate in the two arms. If we see in terms of uh, the self-reported questionnaire, so there was a rating of the score or the comparison of the score that was conducted with the help of the radar plot. And uh, here we can see that uh, there are two, on the axis we see various symptoms. The line in between are the duration and the solid line is for the neck dissection arm and the dotted line is for the sentinel node arm. Now, if we look at the various months, which is two, four, six, and 12, we see initially there's a significant difference in the number of patients having the symptoms. As we proceed in time, we see towards the end of six months, it is overlapping almost. And at the end of 12 months, almost all the symptoms are overlapping. So definitely it is limiting the morbidity of the shoulder dysfunction, but it manifests only up to the 12 months. After that, it evens out. And at the end of 24 months, there is no significant difference in the shoulder morbidity. In terms of the arm abduction test, again, if we see at the two months, four months, and six months, we see that there is a significant difference uh, in the arm abduction in neck dissection arm, where significantly lesser number of patients can perform compared to the sentinel node arm. Again, at the 12 months and 24 months, there was no significant difference. Uh, this was a, another landmark trial which followed the publication of the French trial. This was from the Japanese group conducted by Hasegawa et al. And again, this was also a multicentric randomized control trial, uh, phase three, non-inferiority, and it involved 16 Japanese center. And it compared the non-inferiority of a sentinel lymph node biopsy navigated neck dissection with elective neck dissection in the tumor category of T1, T2, N0, oral squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, the median follow-up for this study was 3.1 years and uh, they analyzed, uh, they uh, recruited 271 patients. And uh, when they followed up the sentinel lymph node group, the three years overall survival was 87.9% compared to 86.6% in the neck dissection group. And again, this was non-inferior. So again, we can see both the curves in terms of disease-free survival and overall survival overlapping curves with no significant difference and sentinel node being non-inferior to the neck dissection arm. Again, coming on to the functional outcomes of the trial, uh, here we see that, uh, again, in terms of arm abduction test, uh, the, the, the difference manifested till the end of six months. Here, they have taken the uh, significant value of 0 0.001 because they have performed the test multiple times. And uh, till the end of six months, we can see some difference in some of the symptoms. However, again, we notice hardly any uh, difference at the end of 12 months. Uh, in terms of uh, the questionnaire, when again, uh, they compared the arm abduction test, there was a difference which manifested till the end of six months. And again, it evened out at the end of 12 months. Now, from these two trials, there have been publication of uh, numerous meta-analysis. And this one is uh, from Tata Memorial Hospital, published by uh, Dr. Gupta et al. And in this, they have extracted the individual level participant data uh, based on the kaplan mayer survival curve from both the randomized control trial. And here we can see, again, with 550 patients, there is absolutely intertwining of the curve, and there was no significant difference. So uh, SLNB is non-inferior to the overall survival. Now, this is just a summary. If you look at how the three trials, uh, three landmark trials that have established the oncologic safety of the sentinel lymph node biopsy, if we compare all the three, that is French trial, Japanese trial, and SEN trial. So uh, here we see that uh, 279 patients in French trial, 271 patients in Japanese trial, and 415 patients in SEN trial 
P1, T2, oral squamous cell carcinoma. They had different endpoints of two years necrotic recurrence free survival, three years overall survival, and disease specific survival. And all the three trials, the Sentinel lymph node identification rate was excellent. It was 94.3% in the French trial, 98.5% in the Japanese trial, and it was 99.5% in the Sen trial. Again, if we look at the false negative rate, uh, internationally now accepted. Most of the studies are coming out with a similar figure. So in, from three landmark trials we have for the French trial, it was 15.4%. For the Japanese trial, it was 15.1%. And SEN trial, it is 14%. False negative rate is extremely important in the sentinel node biopsy in establishing the diagnostic accuracy. Because if we miss out the nodes, then uh, the probability of salvaging, if they later come with the manifest disease is low and SEN trial, only 50% of the patient could be salvaged. And uh, uh, again, there is a little discrepancy or little heterogeneity regarding the pathological uh, uh, processing protocol. So the French trial used a frozen section, which was less, less extensive, but Japanese trial used a two millimeter block uh, frozen section, rapid uh, frozen section, which was more extensive and it was not done in SEN trial. And uh, the histopathology was extensive in French trial, little less extensive in Japanese trial. And again, it was exhaustive in the SEN trial. So this is a summary. There have been numerous uh, meta-analysis that have been published with these uh, trials and all have uh, come out with a similar results that uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy is oncologically a safe procedure and it can be a suitable alternative to elective neck dissection in these cases and it definitely limits the morbidity. So, of course, we have a shift in the shifting paradigm in the management of uh, node negative neck uh, in early oral cancer, where we had the debate between the whether we should be doing a wait and watch policy and therapeutic neck dissection versus elective neck dissection. We took a step ahead and elective neck dissection became the standard of care and to limit the morbidity of the elective neck dissection, a step was taken further and it was a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And today, sentinel lymph node biopsy is a very viable option in the treatment of these cancers. And it is there in the current NCCN guidelines and it is a suitable alternative. We have the surgical consensus guidelines, which have been published on sentinel lymph node biopsy in oral cancers. It talked about it, this article talks about the various aspects of sentinel lymph node biopsy and how to perform and what to consider as a sentinel node. So those are the important guidelines that have been laid down. Numerous other um, ways of doing the sentinel lymph node biopsy are being explored, which one of which is endocyanin green, methylene blue. Uh, they look promising, but uh, unlikely to replace the uh, nanocolloid because for these styles, uh, if we have to pick up the node, we have to open the planes and see. Whereas for the nanocolloid, it is from the intact skin, we can identify the location of the node. So when we are doing a uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy, we should ensure that not many extra planes are being opened because in case we have to go back, then there's a lot of inflammation and to go back and do the completion neck in the infra, uh, inflammatory uh, neck could be a little challenging. So in with endocyanin green and methylene blue, extensively, we have to open the neck to see the node. So that's why they are not very viable option. Nanocolloid is the current accepted gold standard. And that is how we go ahead with uh, the neck uh, with the lymph node biopsy in oral cancers. Despite of it, its benefit, if we critically look at the sentinel lymph node biopsy, not many centers have been able to implement it. This is the data from uh, the US centers. And here we see that uh, in 8,328 eligible patients who had the median follow-up of 35.4 months, the SLMB was used only in 2240 patients. That is only in 2.9% of stage one and stage two squamous cell carcinoma. Despite the fact that completion neck dissection could be avoided in 64% of the patients. So it definitely limited the morbidity. It shortened the uh, hospital stay. Despite of this fact, uh, it was not being done in many centers of uh, US. So of course, there is some limitation to the sentinel lymph node biopsy. Uh, what are these limitations? The limitation is that there is a need for the infrastructure. We need a uh, nuclear medicine department, we need a surgery department, and we need a pathological, dedicated pathological department because there's extensive pathological processing. And we need a total sync and coordination between these three departments. So when a sentinel lymph node biopsy is performed, it has to be accurate at all the three levels to make sure that it is being done properly. It is not only the surgeon identifying it. It is right from the beginning till the processing. We should not miss it on any level. So there is a need for the extensive dedicated infrastructure. It is a two-stage procedure. In case we are not able to detect it in the frozen section, nearly 10% of the patient will need a second surgery. So we need to take the patient second time in theater and it is then in the inflammatory conditions, we have to complete the neck. 
it has a labor intensive pathological protocol which i already mentioned and it uh, identifies a significant number of itcs and today we are unclear about what to do with these itcs should it be considered as both positive or negative we are unclear about it and it, in both settings if there's a resource constraint setting and if there's a high volume center in both these settings it becomes extremely difficult to make it a standard and to offer it to each and every patient uh, this is again uh, the comparison of how many patients needed the second surgery and how many could be identified so uh, we can see that in sentimeroral trial at least in itcs they did not do the completion uh, neck dissection and majority of the macrometastases can be detected in the frozen section so definitely if the itcs are being observed the incidence or the chance of having a second surgery is reduced and in Japanese trial, uh, they considered everything as positive. So significant more number of patients would need a completion neck dissection. In SEN trial, again, they considered all the groups as positive and uh, all the patients who were re reported as positive underwent second surgery uh, neck dissection because they did not do the frozen section at all. Now, uh, this is a perspective uh, that we published uh, last year in uh, oral oncology, that it is uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy in non-negative early oral cancer solution to the conundrum. So, of course, there are problems. We need to find the solution. We need to find out how to deal with the ITCs. Should they be considered as positive and negative? And to what extent to chase a neck dissection and the use of radiotherapy? Uh, many uh, other uh, oncologies like breast and melanoma, it's a well-established procedure. So obviously they have already overcome certain limitations and we should implement it to our cancers as well. And uh, otherwise we can go ahead with a simple elective neck dissection, which is oncologically safe and just a spare level 2B and 5, which will also limit the morbidity. So these could be the probable solution to the conundrum. We now have uh, done nearly 100 um, sentinel lymph node biopsy in our department. This is the data that we had um, sent for the presentation in AHNS uh, this year. And this had number till November 2022. And in this, we had 60 patients of which 58 were analyzed and uh, 53 tongues, five buccal mucosa, 25 T1s and 33 T2s. In majority of the patients, we use methylene blue as an adjunct. However, in three patients, we use endocyanin green and in one patient, we use none. So with this combination, the detection rate of our sentinel node was 98.3. The node was ipsilateral in 87.9% of the patients, bilateral in 6.9% of the patients, and contralateral in 3.4% of the patients. So this is the additional advantage of the sentinel lymph node biopsy over elective neck dissection, that it detects the contralateral neck node metastasis, which otherwise for the lateralization probably will miss with elective neck dissection. In all these cases, we had uh, done a node localization using the planar imaging, and the SPECT was performed within an hour to identify the location of the node. Occult metastasis was seen in 22.4% of the cases and sentinel node was metastatic in 11 cases and in two cases where the SNV was negative, uh, the node was detected at other levels. Metastatic nodes was detected at other levels. So those were the false negative cases. So the specificity uh, of our procedure was 84.6%. Negative predictive value was uh, sensitivity was 84.6%, specificity was 100%, negative predictive value was 96%, and positive predictive value was 100%. We also looked at uh, that when the frozen section was performed, it could not identify the sentinel lymph node in two cases, and therefore the sensitivity of the frozen section was 75%, and negative predictive value was 93.6%. So the false negative rate of our uh, procedure was 15.4%, which is within what has been reported in literature. So it is definitely feasible at our center, and we are in process of standardizing it, which is by and large done. So with this, we can conclude that sentinel lymph node biopsy in oral cancer is an oncologically safe procedure. It limits the shoulder morbidity and shortens the hospital stay. However, the difference evens out at the end of one year. There are certain limitations with the use of sentinel lymph node biopsy that restrict the widespread applicability. However, if the infrastructure permits and it is feasible, it's a suitable and preferred alternative over the elective neck dissection. There's a small uh, video which I thought of sharing with you all as how the procedure is done for the understanding. Many of you may be doing it. So this is how it is. The ideal case for the sentinel lymph node biopsy is a T1, T2 lateralized oral tongue as we can see in this case. So this is a way it's it, it, like in the middle third of the tongue, which is easily accessible, more posterior, the injection becomes difficult and it may also have a contralateral drainage. So a freshly prepared nanocolloid is injected in the four quadrants around uh, the tumor. This is a technetium 99 leveled human serum albumin. So this is being injected. 
at 6, 9, 12, and 3 o'clock position. It's very, very important to appropriately inject it because if it is not injected properly, the localization will be spurious and there's a chance of missing the node. We should not go too deep. The depth has to be somewhere uh, matching with the depth of the tumor. And this is a dynamic lymphocentigraphy, which is performed for about 30 minutes till we see the emergence of the sentinel node. Sentinel node is not the brightest or the hottest node. It is the node that emerges first in order. So that's the sentinel node. Once the sentinel node appears, then a SPECT is performed. SPECT is not mandatory. However, it is very handy if it is there, because as you can see, here we can see the anatomical location of the sentinel node. We can see the tumor in the tongue, which is being lit up on the SPECT. And as we go down, here we see uh, anterior to the cellocytomastoid muscle behind the gland at the level of the hyoid, we see the sentinel node. So it becomes very, uh, it's the added information which helps a surgeon to identify the node correctly. We do a dual procedure. However, literature allows or there is the guidelines recommend going ahead only with the nanocolloid. Here we are injecting methylene blue as an adjunct. The benefit of methylene blue is easy identification as we will see subsequently. Again, in the similar four quadrants, a methylene blue is being injected using a tuberculin syringe. Usually it takes about uh, 15 to 20 minutes for the methylene blue to reach the sentinel node. It is prudent to confirm the activity in the primary. It helps us with two things that the injection has been done properly. The nanocolloid has been injected properly and a probe is functioning. And it also gives us a rough idea about the background activity, which is less than 1% of what we are injecting in the primary. In, uh, in these cases, the primary should be excised first to avoid any shine through effect or interference by the activity in the primary. I'll skip over this part. It's just the wide excision of the tongue that is being performed. Once the tongue is excised, we have an idea because our colleagues mark it for us. However, it, there may be a slight difference because of sitting in the supine position. So it should be con confirmed with a handheld gamma probe. Once the position is confirmed, the incision is marked in such a way that in case we have to do the completion and dissection, it can be done through the same skin crease. However, if the location is very aberrant, like level five and all, a separate incision can be taken at those levels. A small incision measuring about 3.5 to 4 centimeter is adequate, much smaller than what is needed for the elective neck dissection. The important point here is that we should keep the incision small and should not open extra planes. As I mentioned before, more planes we open, more difficult it is for us to go back. And we should be very, very careful because these incisions are small. So we don't get the full visibility of the underlying structures. So the anatomical orientation should be absolutely sound so as not to damage any underlying structure. Here we can see the flap is being raised in the subplatysmal plane. The location is being confirmed with a probe. Had it been endocyanin green or methylene blue, there was a need to open up more planes and identify the blue or the green node, which is not required in this case. Once you confirm the position, the dissection is performed in that direction as guided by the probe. We can see the <clears throat> underlying vein. Since we have given methylene blue in this case, the node is going to have a bluish hue. The bluish hue helps to identify the node easily. As we can see, this is a bluish hue. So we confirmed, we had confirmed the location with a handheld gamma probe. And uh, this bluish hue is helping us identify it visually as well. So we are doubly sure that we are at the right node. A meticulous dissection, something similar to when we do the lymph node biopsy. But at the same time, when we are not taking extra structures around, we should be very, very careful not to rupture the capsule of the node. 
it should be an intact node with a intact capsule. Many a times in tongue, it is at level two, which is just overlying the IJV. So it's better to pick up and do a small uh, dissection with the mosquito. Again, confirming the position of the node. That's the node. That's the node. They are actually two nodes together. So for adequate uh, sentinel node, at least two to three nodes should be harvested. That is what, it should not be more than five and six also. It's a kind of a failure of the procedure. If too many nodes are being identified, we should be able to identify the right node. And it is very, very important to confirm the activity X vivo means outside the body. And once it has been uh, confirmed outside the body, it is also very, very important to confirm the residual activity in the basin, which should be less than the 10% of the hottest node. So in this case, if we are getting activity around uh, 1300, If it is not coming down below the 10% of the hottest node, in that case, further probing of the basin should be done. When we are keeping a probe, we should be very, very careful to keep it away from the floor of mouth because uh, there's interference with the primary and the draining lymphatics. All other nodes, even if not identified on spec, should be confirmed with the probe. And if there is any doubtful node, should be taken out. And also, if there is any obvious metastatic node, should also be taken out because if it is blocked, they may not uh, pick up uh, the nanocolloid and may not. Uh, show the signal, so that is important. Um, thank you. I'll be happy to take questions if there are any. So thank you, Dr. Richa. Uh, excellent video and presentation. Uh, I think there are a lot of questions, Dr. Richa. I will just read uh, uh, them one by one. So uh, what are the implications of sentinel node biopsy in early floor of mouth carcinoma? Uh, see, early floor of mouth carcinoma, there, I mean, it has been described, but it is flawed because we all know that there's a shine through defect. So if we have a node at the primary, which is in close proximity to each other, it is very, very difficult then to pick up with a handheld gamma probe because there'll be a lot of interference in the detection of the activity. So therefore, the accuracy in detecting the floor of mouth carcinoma is slightly limited. Uh, alternative could be endocyanin green in those cases. Because when you open up the neck, you may find the sentinel node. But again, the technique is not very, very standardized and you end up opening a lot of planes. So there is a limited applicability when it comes to the floor of mouth carcinomas. Correct. So if the uh, sentinel node uh, becomes positive, what should be the extent of neck dissection? So uh, if I go by the simple logic, like we are doing an elective neck dissection in those cases. So if the... If you're anyways going ahead and do it, since majority of these patients have a node which is at 2A, because these are tongue. So that's level two where it is most commonly seen. So uh, there could be a school of thought as we believe that 2A is what is the predictor of level 2B and 5 metastasis. So there could be a way to go ahead with 1 to 5 clearance in these cases then, which will be around 10% of the patients. How soon should be the completion neck dissection be done? See, I mean, once the 72 hours after the initial procedure has elapsed, the chances of inflammation is very, very high. But sooner the better in case you have to give adjuvant radiotherapy to these patients. So even if you're doing it 7 and 10 days, the inflammation will definitely be there. So we will not be able to match up with the 3 days and that 90 days window. Either of the two will not fit. So sooner the better. As soon as your pathologist can process it and give you the report, we'll have to do the completion neck dissection. And in case we have to do the radiotherapy gift adjuvant treatment to the patient, then it has to be done within 3 to 4 weeks. So uh, how do you go ahead if uh, SLN uh, shows micrometastasis? In cases of micrometastasis, we would go back invariably and do the completion neck dissection. Uh, emerging data in cases of ITC, probably ITCs can be observed. But there also it is limited data. So it is not a concrete uh, evidence that we can definitely observe it. But uh, from the French trial, it looks like that it can be observed. So in cases of uh, endocyanin green dye, uh, 
hai uh, how many patients hot node can be seen from intact skin and in how many patients how much patient skin incision has to be taken to identify green hot node intraoperatively i think the yeah you yeah understood? so yeah, yeah i understood the question and this is sometimes being asked if we look at the literature mm -hmm. they say that up to the depth of 1 cm you can see but honestly if the node is deep to the sclerotomastoid muscle with the intact skin you will not be able to see it you will have so to any... open the pens because more nodes are located more than a centimeter depth only so it usually you will have to open up and see sure i any... have never identified it through the intact skin ever in whatever cases i have done i have never identified it through the intact skin correct so any study for icgs where they have shown like data regarding the same uh, i shared the last the last small meta analysis which i showed is one but as it has been done in limited number of cases yes. you have to open up the pins cannot identify through the intact skin so unlikely that uh, you know that would be the way to go ahead as a single procedure correct so how to proceed if t1 t2 lesion is midline if the t1 t2 lesion is midline you can still go ahead with the uh, injection you will get a contralateral representation and in those case both the sides should be explored in the sentinel if not harvested any side positive needs a completion neck dissection so has the dual dye technique any effect on false negative rate uh, as compared to single if dye we, like if we look better? at the so it has a pros it has cons there are studies that support a dual dye role it has mainly been extrapolated from the melanoma of course it's fatal to miss it there it's fatal to miss it here there are studies which say that, that the accuracy improves with a dual dye but also there are studies which have raised a concern because uh, if once you inject the dye the whole periphery of the tumor is injected so then to appreciate the margins becomes a bit difficult and to appreciate the anatomy so that is why it is not so many of the guidelines now prefer to omit the dual dye technique if you look at the iowa guidelines and all they just recommend uh, the no colloid uh, there are a lot of questions dr richa i think a lot of enthusiasm among students any study of icg plus methyl in blue i think same uh, in as technician 19 tech technician not available everywhere almost similar any study which only shows icg with methylene instead of involving the gamma pro and everything There are studies that talk about only methylene blue. There are studies that talk about only endocyanin green. But the point is that that if we cannot identify the node and we have to open and see the levels, it is okay if your all sentinel nodes are negative. You are absolutely safe. In case you have to go back and do the completion neck dissection, it becomes extremely difficult. The same thing continues. So that's why the nano colloid. There are studies, many studies with only methylene blue, many studies with only endocyanin green. I am not aware about the combination, but they could be with the combination as well. But the limitations are. by and last the same for both the procedures so the acceptable false negative rate for sentinel node biopsy is 10% for head and neck it is 15% is is that acceptable i don't know the question exactly but yeah, so the, the false negative rate if you're talking about other sites like breast and melanoma and you're talking about the head and neck we also have been very very uh, uh, fussy about the false negative rate when we were talking about the diagnostic accuracy of the sentinel lymph node biopsy once we did the landmark trials establishing the safety of the sentinel lymph node biopsy we see that it comes somewhere around 40 to 50% 15% and the rebuttal for this is that even if we are doing a elective neck dissection nearly 13% of the patients would still develop the, the recurrence in the elective neck dissection so even that is not full proof so the figures are matching so that is the rational that we give but if we look at the comparison which is coming from the french and the japanese trial with a false negative rate of about 15% we see that it is not inferior to elective neck dissection i think this is a level one evidence which can be accepted that it's fine to have 15% how to confirm the accurate position of sentinel node with the help of gamma probe and what are the readings which should be considered as the okay. sentinel so it not only the handheld gamma probe three steps to identify the sentinel lymph node first is the node which is appearing first on the lymphocytography it's a planar imaging so we will not be able to identify the exact location but once the node has appeared it is always uh, beneficial to supplement it with a spec scan as i told you and as i showed you in the video in correspondence to the landmarks the structures around you know the position of the node whether it is anterior to the sclerotomastoid at the level of the hyoid at the level of the thyroid posterior to the submandibular gland all these structures can be seen on spec that is a second step you identify the node your colleagues help you mark the position of the node in the when, when they are doing the imaging downstairs that is a third thing and fourth is a handheld probe so handheld probe is you measure the activity in the background 10 times the background activity should be the activity in the node and as i said once you have cleared 
the basin, you should go back and check the residual activity, which should be less than 10% of the hottest node. So the highest activity that you get, uh, get in the node, maybe two or three number, the highest one you consider, the basin should go show you the activity, which should be less than 10% of it. And most of the time when the sentinel nodes are out, actually the basin activity would be merging with the background activity. So that is how you, with the help of all these four steps, you'll identify the correct node. So if adjuvant treatment is needed because of the primary tumor adverse features, uh, so will your management change regarding the neck dissection if it is a SN, I mean, like positive node versus a negative node on a central node? Uh, I like, didn't really get the context of the question, but... Means, hmm. Now, will, they, will you consider uh, completion neck dissection before adjuvant in SN... I think that will not change it depending Nothing upon... Nothing will change. Yeah. If the sentinel node is positive, I would try to go back early, finish the neck and, and then send the patient for radiotherapy. I would not leave the neck only to the radiotherapy. As we all know, salvage may be difficult and these uh, nodes come back with a lot of aggressive features and then to address is difficult. From our previous paper, we know that 50% of the patient will succumb to disease if we don't take it out adequately. Correct. So if the node is negative and we are treating the, uh, the, the primary before the adjuvant, then it will we'll go ahead with the same absolutely then uh, then we nothing to do with the neck we just go ahead with the yeah. adjuvant treatment yeah so if it is sl sn slnb positive will go ahead and complete the neck if it is negative will not complete not the neck and will go ahead with the adjuvant treatment as it was. so absolutely. what is the scope of sentinel lymph node biopsy in contralateral lymph node when degen is crossing midline i think you already touched upon that yeah we discussed it hmm. In contralateral lymph node when region is crossing midline. See, when uh, as of now, the role of sentinel lymph node biopsy has been established only in T1, T2 cancer. If it is significantly crossing the midline, if it is a very deep lesion, uh, it's probably a T3, T4 we are dealing with. And I think there we should abide by the concept of going ahead with the elective neck dissection. Only a small lesion which is reaching up to the midline or slightly, you know, crossing the midline is also unlikely with small lesions. And very few cases you will see lesions like this. So if it is a T3, T4, I would advise going ahead with the neck dissection. So I think this is regarding a recurrent case. If there is any role of uh, this SNB in addressing the contralateral neck in cases where ipsilateral neck is already addressed. Uh, this concept is being explored. It may show some benefits, but to standardize it, I mean, it has to be done very, very rigorously, exactly the way we have done to establish it in the treatment naive case. And only then we can rely on it completely. So for now, with the altered lymphatics, would it be 100% accurate and, you know, safe? Uh, it's difficult to comment. Although initial, some studies have shown, yes, it may be okay. Uh, I think there is one more uh, question, Dr. Richa. Uh, what is the this concept of tilmenocept? I think that... See, there are various dyes which are being explored yes. and various methods which are being explored. So they'll come up with a combination. They're also working upon clubbing the nanocolloid with the endocyanin green. So we will have papers like this. And uh, for now, as I said, there will be many more combinations to come. But for now, it is a nanocolloid, which is a standard. And as we get a better colloid, accuracy improves. I'm sure we'll switch on to the next method. Next Correct. So with this, we conclude today's uh, presentation. Uh, I think it was a wonderful uh, lecture. There is one more question. Only thing, one point, point I would just uh, say is that the presentation which Dr. Richard did was after a lot of experience and a lot of uh, this uh, working for years. So we should uh, be well versed first with the proper neck dissection, which is level one to five neck dissection. And it is a, a very method methodical procedure which we should be able to learn after doing a uh, few cases. I think Dr. Richard, minimum of 10 cases are needed as per the guidelines, right? So that should be kept in mind. Absol and, absolutely. Uh, only after you are very well trained in your neck dissection, as well as you know the technique properly, you have the facilities, then only you should go ahead with the procedure. But that is... Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I think, uh, Richard, I think we'll take the one last uh, question, one more. If in case of ipsilateral recurrence, uh, not crossing midline for which prior ipsilateral neck dissection was done and the neck was then irradiated. I think the question is if there is recurrence and it then is would you consider? Midline. Yeah, would you yeah, consider so the same? Neck? Same it's neck. The altered uh, lymphatics. We don't have a robust evidence to say that it is safe to do in these cases. So there is a need for more data. Some preliminary data is promising, but we need definitely more data to say that it is oncologically safe. So today I will not rely on the recurrent case. I won't. Yes, I think for now it is the uh, 
apart yeah, treatment nine absolutely t1 t2 lateralize treatment so nine. don't extrapolate it for the recurrent cases recurrent absolutely yeah yeah so we formally conclude now uh, thank you everyone and thank you dr richa a great presentation thank you thank you thank you so much dr poonam